Hey guys, welcome back. So today I'm working on this 5,500 watt storm responder generator. Uh, this one belongs to a local subscriber, Eric, who actually reached out back in 2020 asking for help. He sent me a short video basically saying he couldn't get his engine to start. And based on that video, it really seemed like it had a blown engine. And now that it's here, I can confirm that engine is for sure blown. The piston is not connected anymore to that crankshaft. So yeah, I don't know if it ran out of oil or exactly what the story is on this. That said, usually they only die from a lack of oil. So that is most likely what happened here. Anyway, I gave him a couple options as far as what he wanted to do. You know, potentially I could rebuild this engine. I also have another engine I rebuilt a couple months back and is ready to go. The only downside is that it is a previously blown up engine that ran out of oil and the bottom of the cylinder does have a chunk missing. So he didn't like those options. So I gave him a third, which is to use a brand new Subaru EX30 engine. And those are very nice engines and they do have an oil sensor. So he opted for that. So let's get this inside. We'll get this up on the lift. We'll start taking this apart and swap out that engine. So let's just start by getting the oil out. See if there's any in there. Actually, it's already loose, the drain bolt. Which probably isn't a good sign. Yeah, there is some oil in there anyway. Just gonna take this cap off. It's coming out kind of slow. I'm not sure if that means we're low. Yeah, we might be low. It's been just over five minutes and we still have oil coming out of the engine. So yeah, it's hard to say if this one ran out of oil or not. And it is coming out very slowly. So I'm thinking there is a piece of the connecting rod most likely blocking the drain. So I guess while waiting for that, I'm gonna move on to the tank. I wanna get it uninstalled. Uh, first though, I wanna get the fuel drained. I know it's been in there for at least three years. And yeah, fuel has a pretty limited shelf life. This fuel I don't think is bad yet, but I certainly don't wanna keep it in there any longer. Anyway, I think you get the idea. It's gonna take a while to get all the fuel out of the tank. You know, as far as the oil goes, it did finally stop draining. And yeah, it looks like we were a little low, but there is a surprising amount of oil in there for an engine with a blown connecting rod. And although the oil does look fairly new, I wouldn't say it's brand new. So I think the engine was running on this oil. So yeah, maybe it didn't run out of oil. So yeah, there's really only two of the possibilities here. Either the engine over revved and blew the connecting rod, but the throttle is not stuck. And I guess more likely might be that this was run on a hill and it was tilted in such a way that the oil was just out of reach from the dipper and the engine lost lubrication. Anyway, we'll get this mess cleaned up and start taking this apart. Let's see how much oil came out of the engine. It should be about 28 ounces, which is just over, I would say 825 milliliters. And in this case, yeah, we're about half, you know, actually less than that. We're at 325 milliliters, just under 12 ounces. So yeah, not, not a ton of oil. It was down for sure, but that should have been enough to keep the engine going if it was on a level surface. I 
I guess while we're here, I'm gonna get the control panel disconnected from the stator. There's just a quick disconnect here. Then I'm gonna get the control panel actually out of the way. It's gonna make things easier when getting actually the new Subaru engine in because the Subaru crankshaft exits about an inch higher up and it comes really close to this control panel. So what I find works best is remove the control panel, get everything installed, and then try to fit it back where it belongs. Everything looks nice and clean in here. You can definitely tell the difference between something that was stored indoors versus out. And that's a bit of a concern for the powerhead, especially on the rotor. I've been getting a lot of rotors recently that have failed due to bad solder connections. And I think that's partially due to the corrosion from maybe improperly cleaned flux, but also being outside exposed to moisture certainly isn't helping. All right, so we get the brushes and the AVR out of the way. And really the only other thing I need to do here is remove these two bolts to get access for the puller and maybe get that ground wire disconnected as well. At least as far as the wiring goes, we still need to free the end housing and this ground wire that runs down. Spider web holding that one on. Gonna use a bit of leverage just to lift the stator a little bit so that we can get these mounts off. It's pretty tight clearance from the top of the frame here, so you need to get clearance any way you can in order to get this stator uninstalled with it hanging up on the frame. Yeah, sometimes you get lucky and the stator just comes off. Uh, usually though, you need a puller and just go easy. The in housings break with minimal force and you don't want to hook the puller where the brushes go. That's the weakest point. And you're pretty much guaranteed to break the end housing. So when applying force here, you really want to go light if you start building any kind of pressure, you need to stop and kind of rethink about it. Because if you keep going, you will damage the end housing. Yeah, it's coming.
but there is some drag, and that's because I forgot the ground wire. Right there. try the easy thing here and just give this bolt a few taps which theoretically should pop the rotor off the shaft you know in this case I'm not so sure this is a thinner bolt you can see how loose it is in there this is only eight millimeters in diameter so it bends a lot easier than the wider 10 millimeter bolt so you don't want to go crazy on this if it doesn't happen in a few hits go to plan b before you destroy the bolt or even worse pretzel it in the shaft here Might have been it. So we'll take a quick little look inside this engine. I'm not gonna rebuild it, at least not in this video. But it'd be good to know what we have. So I'm gonna get the spark plug out, we'll get the exhaust off and then just remove the bolts for the sump cover and have a look. I just fished what's left of the connecting rod out of the bottom of the sump. So yeah, I would say a little oil event occurred here. And looking inside the engine, you can see what's left of the connecting rod just barely. You know, it's still connected to the piston. It's at the top of its travel. So most likely it bent the valves, I'm thinking. And you can see some scoring on the cylinder. You know, as far as the crankshaft goes, it's really hard to get a good look. You know, I did not take the flywheel off so I can't get the crankshaft out but I can see there was a bunch of aluminum transfer onto that crank so yeah I mean is this engine rebuildable maybe but that's for a different day so let's set this aside and get that Subaru installed
I just wanted to put these engines side by side so that we could compare and kind of contrast the difference here. Now, technically, the Briggs is the bigger engine. It's rated at 10 horsepower. But when you look at these two engines, the Subaru is physically much larger. And I have loaded these before to 6,000 watts. They have no issue doing it. And this generator is only rated at 5,500 watts. So I think we'll be okay with the slightly less powerful engine. Now, there are a few complications. Like I mentioned before, if you look at the crankshaft where it exits, it's quite a bit different. You know, on the Briggs, we're about four and a quarter inches. And on the Subaru, it's closer to five and a quarter. So we have a difference of an inch, which isn't a big deal. But on the powerhead side, the feet that support the powerhead are now an inch too short. So we're going to have to figure that out. Also, the exhaust systems are not compatible, so I cannot use the Briggs exhaust on the Subaru. Now, I do have a Subaru exhaust. It's not in the best shape, so we're going to have to clean that up. Anyway, let's get this onto the frame and start putting it together. I think it's safe to assume this shipped without oil, so I'm going to start with some straight weight 30 for the break-in, and then we'll switch to synthetic later. So Subaru has a whole break-in procedure on this engine, which I'm not going to do until I have the generator fully assembled. But one thing I do want to do now that we have oil in the engine is just rotate it by putting a drill on the flywheel nut and just spin the engine fast enough to get that oil splashing around. So I'm going to pull the spark plug just rotate the engine a bunch, and I think we'll be good then to start the engine because although it's a new engine, it has been sitting around in a warehouse for some time. It, it could very well be 10 years old, so I'd rather rotate it at a slower speed, get the oil kind of splashed everywhere it needs to be, and then when we start it for real, it gives it the best chance possible. Okay, that's good enough for now. We get the oil all splashed around. So I'm gonna turn this thing around. We'll get the power head on and I'm gonna leave the starter recoil off for now because when I torque down on the rotor bolt, I can use the flywheel nut to hold the crank still so I can torque that rotor down to 18 foot-pounds. I'm going to use a bit of Loctite on these. Uh, they have lock washers, so you usually don't need both. Although I do normally see Loctite instead of lock washers. And in this case, I'll just use both because you don't want one of these getting loose. So if it does, it's going to destroy the power head pretty quick.
Just going to take a second here and clean up the slip rings while we have good access. And then I need to torque down that bolt. But before I do that, I'm going to build a shoulder on this bolt. Otherwise, when you tighten it up, it kind of goes sideways. Not that it's a big deal, but I'd rather have it centered and know that it's torqued properly. Because if it's torqued to one side and then it moves to the center, that's going to change the stretch or the preload on that bolt. And apparently it doesn't matter too much because the manufacturer doesn't do that. None of them do. But it can't hurt. And just be very wary of these wires. That's what commonly breaks on these rotors. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this engine's going to outlast the rotor on this machine because these solder joints on all these machines don't look that great. And that seems to be the weak link. The weak link. Got the breaker bar and the flywheel nut holding the crankshaft still. As far as getting the height we need, you can see this end housing, the feet are pretty much flat. And that's what the Briggs engine needs. Now, every other engine I've worked on, it is about an inch higher. And this storm responder is a bit unique. Usually they don't have an AVR. This one has an AVR and it's more of a Honda clone style power head. And what I'm thinking is that I might be able to use one of the end housings from an actual Honda clone. And that's going to give us the inch we need. So let's grab a bell housing off of one of these and see if it's gonna work on the Briggs powerhead. I just double checked this housing by putting it on the other end, on the bell housing side, and it fit on the stator without issue. And the ball bearing looks to be the same as well. So I think this is gonna work. We just need to remove these two bolts. This actually sandwiches the end housing to the stator. And the other stator I just worked on actually stole those bolts for something else. Technically you don't need them, but it makes the installation a lot easier if the end housing is bolted and attached physically to the stator.
I'm just rotating the end housing so that this hole on the end housing lines up with the hole that goes through the stator. Yeah, and I think it's fully seated, so we should be fine. I don't have a torque spec on this bolt. And truthfully, you don't need one. It has a nylock nut. The sole purpose of this bolt is just to hold the end housing onto the stator. But all the clamping force is with these outer bolts that we're going to add later. So just make them snug. And that should be fine. So the insulators that were on here before, they're not compatible with this power head. So I'm using these, which are a Honda clone type insulator. They actually came off a of Generac. And I think that's gonna level things out for us pretty good. So let's just get all these bolts tightened down. We'll double check if things are nice and level and also turn the engine over. I wanna make sure that the rotor is not making any contact with the stator. I don't know what it is, but I have some sort of mental block with this ground wire down here. So as you can guess, I forgot to install it. So this is not the original grounding wire. It's actually one from a Generac. And I'm using it because it's meant specifically to attach to the mounting bolt, which is a much easier way of doing it. The other grounding wire, it was actually drilled in to the end housing. So we can just tighten that up, maybe turn it more like that, get it out of the way. And we should be good.
yeah, I think that end housing did it. We are nice and level within the frame. So at this point, it's worth double checking a few things before finalizing everything. You know, I did put the control panel back in loosely just to make sure we had clearance and it cleared without issue. And I also installed the brushes to check the alignment. Uh, with this end housing, the alignment could be thrown off and these brushes need to be centered on the slip rings. And that's what I saw. So things are looking pretty good. You know, at this point before finalizing the wiring, I think it makes sense to just pull the engine over. You know, I wanna make sure the rotor spins freely, that it's not scraping on the stator or even worse, binding up. Because if it is, then you're gonna make quick work of this generator and yeah, it's not gonna make power. So let's try that real quick and make sure we're good. Perfect. So I think we'll start by reconnecting this wire block. Now I may need to trim that insulation back a bit. We'll have to keep an eye on that when putting it back together, it's down a little further than it should be. So I just wanna make sure that that doesn't interfere with making a good electrical connection. Now the real interesting thing here is that the wire harness coming down from the control panel the coloring doesn't, doesn't match at all. You know, we have blue to red, black to brown, gray to white, and red to blue. Um, yeah, seems a little strange. Anyway. Yeah, let me cut these back just a bit before proceeding here. Let's see, red to blue. And then brown to black. And we'll just reconnect the ground wire. Now I'm guessing this is bonded to neutral up in the control panel because I don't see a jumper between neutral and ground down here. And most generators are not floating by default. Although some are, for some reason inverters, they always are floating neutral. Make sure the red wire goes on the left. It is polarity sensitive to the rotor. It's not going to cause damage if you plug it in the wrong way, but your generator most likely will not power up. So we'll just get those screws removed here and bolt the AVR on. I'm going to leave the end open for now. because so we might need to adjust the voltage on the AVR. I was just double checking a few things before moving on and encountered an issue with the end cover. You know, it looked pretty tight and despite my best efforts, I can't get the cover to go on. Uh, there is a little piece of 
aluminum right there, which I can't get past because this lip is right here. So, you know, there's a few things we can do to kind of resolve that situation. I think the least destructive is just to remove these mounts, lower the stator and put the end cover on and then raise it back up. I've already checked that will fit. Uh, everything else involves either notching out the cover, notching out a piece right here, or just shifting the entire engine on the frame rails forward. So I'm gonna send a note to Eric. I'll actually send him a link to this video and let him decide ultimately how he wants to deal with this. And then we have the exhaust. I do need to paint it up. It's kind of rusty and crusty. You know, I wish I could get a new one. Unfortunately, I cannot locate these. I just happen to have this one because I had one Subaru once that had a blown engine. And if it wasn't for the unavailability of this exhaust, I would buy more of these engines. You know, this one's on eBay for $400 or best offer. You know, I offered the guy $300 because I knew I had an exhaust for it. And he took me up on it. You know, I'm tempted to order another one, but without a supply of exhaust systems, yeah, it's gonna be kind of pointless. So I think at this point, we're just gonna move on. I'm gonna get this exhaust sanded, painted, and we'll bolt it on. Uh, the other thing worthy of note too is that when I tried to take the nut out from the head, uh, the whole stud pulled out for the exhaust. And I've tried a bunch of things to get this nut to release from the stud and it's not having it. So yeah, I mean, potentially we can just drive it in like a bolt. You know, if it doesn't work out, we can always just use a bolt. Anyway, that I'm not too worried about. So let's get this cleaned up and finish this up. All right, I've given this 24 hours. Should be dry enough. The old spark arrestor was actually pretty clean but I do have a bunch of new ones hanging around, so I'm gonna throw that on in its place. So I think before I go any further, I want to get this thing started. Just make sure the engine's good. I mean, it should be. It's brand new. Make sure the power head's good. Double check the voltage output. And if we're good on all fronts, then we can just finish putting this together and get it outside for some real testing. It's the moment of truth. We are all fueled up and ready to go. I've got the drop light plugged in and turned on and the kilowatt as well. So let's get the engine started and see what we get. Ignition's on, choke's on.
Not too bad. Started first pull. The engine sounds great and we're making power. Now the voltage, it was down a little bit. It was around 116 volts and ideally I would like that above 120. So I'm going to pop that AVR off. I'm going to turn that potentiometer about two turns to get to 120 and maybe an extra turn just to get a bit above. Usually one full turn clockwise will get you two volts. So right there I'm at two turns and we were actually at 117 volts. So technically we should be at 121. I'm going to do another half turn and we'll try it like that. Yeah, people always ask if they can adjust this while the generator is running and technically the answer is yes. Uh, but I would never recommend that. We've got moving parts, high voltage AC, high voltage DC, and a metal screwdriver. Not a good combination. Let's try this again. We are refueled. Hopefully we're a little bit over 120 now. That was much better. Two and a half turns clockwise brought us up six volts. So now we're at 123 volts. So anywhere around 120 volts, plus or minus 5% is perfectly fine. You know, my preference is to be on the higher side than the lower. So let's get the end cap on. We'll get the heat shield and the tank installed and get this thing outside. Don't forget the zip tie. Because if you don't put one here to hold this in place, that can definitely get sucked in and completely destroy your generator. So I just dropped the stock heat shield in place and everything fit. You know, I was about to bolt it down. And then I realized this Subaru exhaust, it's deeper than what was on the Briggs originally by at least an inch. And because of that, the back of the exhaust is actually hitting the heat shield, which normally wouldn't be a big issue. But I think the way they designed this is for airflow. The cool air comes in right here by the flywheel. The fan blows it up over the head 
and then it exits right here. And this piece here is actually more like a scoop. So the air is supposed to flow behind the exhaust and then the scoop brings it out. And with it blocked like this, this is gonna be ineffective. And instead the air is just gonna come out. It's essentially gonna hit a wall and it's gonna go up, it's gonna go in, and some of it's gonna come out. So that is not ideal. So what I'm thinking I'm gonna do here is drill out the rivets that hold this piece in place. We'll just eliminate that altogether. We'll keep this shield for the tank. And instead, I'm gonna put the stock Subaru heat shield on. This one actually bolts on top of the head. It has an additional heat shield on the top and it encapsulates the exhaust and really directs the air out. So let's get this one off. We'll get the Subaru on, we'll modify this tank heat shield a bit and move on. Unfortunately, there is no way to put the heat shield on separately from the exhaust. They have to be put on together. So I need to get those bolts out. We'll pull the exhaust off and then install the heat shield with the exhaust at the same time. And there's a close look at the end result. Uh, not quite as good as I had hoped for. I thought the heat shield was actually gonna block this area right here, which it doesn't. You know, that said, we still are gaining some protection up above here. And there is actually now an air gap between the exhaust and the back of the heat shield. So I think those are both improvements that are only gonna help this thing run cooler. Anyway, let's get those rivets drilled out so we can get the tank shield in place and drop that tank in.
pretty much ready to go. I've got the external tank hooked up and believe it or not, Subaru has a break-in procedure for this engine. So I'm gonna follow it. According to Subaru, we should start it, run it at 2,500 RPM, no load for 10 minutes, bring it up to 3,000 RPM for 10 minutes, and then finally 3,600 for 10 minutes. At that point, we can start putting a load on. They recommend about 1,500 watts for half an hour, 3,000 watts for half an hour. And then at that point, we should be able to bring it up to the max of 5,500 watts. So we need to break this nut free and just back this screw out. This controls the amount of tension on the spring, which sets the engine speed. So we know it's at 3,600 right now. So we'll take a bit off and once it's running, we'll double check it with the tack and set it right to 2,500. So it's time to start putting a load on. We're starting at around 4% THD. Voltage is 243 volts and the Hertz 61.5 Hertz. And the waveform, it's hard to see. So I'll just take a screenshot and put that on your screen. So let's start at 1500 watts. Let that run for a bit. And under a 1500 watt load, we're at 12.6 THD, 244 volts, and the Hertz, we're at 61.1. And the sine wave, I'll put that up on the screen so you can see it.
right, let's bump this up to 3,000 watts. So I'm going to take off the 1,500 and put on 2,000 and another 1,000. So now we're at 3,000 watts. We're at 244 volts. 59.5 hertz. And the THD is at 16%. So let's bring the load up a little bit more. We're at 3,000 now. 3,500. 4,000. We're holding at 59.1 hertz. So we'll shut off these, swap that for a two. So now we're back at 4,000 watts. 4,500. We're at 58.1 hertz. And now 5,000. Ooh, that's not good. We're at 53.5 hertz. So we are out of power at 5,000 watts. We are nice and cool, so we can shut this down. And we'll shut the engine down as well. Looks like we just made it too. The fuel is just about gone. Well, this one, it surprised me and not in a good way. You know, I've tested plenty of these Subaru EX30 engines, some of them pretty beat up and none of them had issues getting up to 5,000 watts. And even a few weeks back, I actually loaded one to 6,000 watts by accident and it kept running just fine. So yeah, this one, we are down a bit on horsepower. I'd say at least one horse is missing from this engine. Now. I've never tested a new engine like this with only one and a half hours of runtime. So I'm going to have to write this one off as maybe the rings have not fully seated yet. So I could run it a little longer. You know, that said, my neighbors still like me and an hour and a half, it's a long time to be running a machine on a weekend. So I'm going to call this one done. And I think Eric just needs to put some more hours on it and he should be in pretty good shape. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. All right, not quite done yet. Let's just drain the oil, take a look at it, make sure there's no surprises. It's pretty clean. No surprises here. The oil looks pretty good. Uh, there is a hint of metallic, and if you look real close, there is a little bit of glitter. And that is why you want to change the oil on a new engine, at least at the five hour mark, if not more. So before signing off, I guess one last thought here. Yeah, I knew when going into this, getting to 5,500 watts with this engine was gonna be a challenge. The original engine was rated at 10 horsepower, this one is nine and a half. So it should have been able to get to about 5,200 watts. And usually this generator engine is found on generators only rated at 5,000 watts. So yeah, I was hoping for the best. And of course we fell short. 
and I never suspected we would fall short of 5,000 watts. I mean, this engine should absolutely be able to do that. So yeah, maybe rings, but I don't think so. And you know, I went back to the video I made on a similar generator with the same engine that I did put a 6,000 watt load on. Of course, that's assuming 240 volts, and that generator actually did not have an AVR. And under that kind of a load, the 240 volt output actually was about 215 volts. So when you do the math, the 25 amps times the 215 volts, I was actually only pulling about 5,200 watts, not the 6,000 that I thought. So what happened here? You know, why didn't we make 5,000 watts? You know, I had 5,000 turned on according to these switches right here. But what I didn't pay attention to were the details. You know, I don't have a watt meter and watts, they're calculated by voltage times amps. And at 5,000 watts, we should have been pulling 19 amps, but we weren't. We were actually pulling 22 amps. And if you remember back in the, earlier in the video, I bumped the voltage up. So we were actually putting out about 245 volts. This has an AVR, it would have kept that voltage steady. So when you take that times the 22 amps, it actually buckled at around 5,400 watts. So I think we did hit 5,000 watts and somewhere between 5,000 and 5,400 is where we reached the limit of what this engine can do. So long story short, don't think there's anything wrong with the engine. I just think it's a little bit undersized for what the original could do. Anyway, now I'm done.